Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, hi, my name is Tom Ball, and uh, I'm happy today to introduce Kunal Agarwal. And she's from MIT, um, finishing her PhD under the supervision of uh, Charles Leisherson in the Supercomputing Technologies Group. And she's worked on a variety of subjects around parallel computing, scheduling, resource al allocation, transactional memory, cache aware, and cache oblivious streaming. And today we're going to hear about uh, some of that work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, scheduling and synchronization for multicores, and I have provably good in parentheses because you will see more theorems than graphs in the talk. So this is my obligatory multicore slide here slide. No parallel computing talk may start without a slide like this. All these blue things are multicores and lots of cores coming up. So now we have to program these computers. Programming on sequential computers is hard enough. Programming for multicores is slightly harder because, well, first we have to develop parallel algorithms. I'm not going to be talking about that. But even if you have a parallel algorithm to solve a problem, you have to manage all these details of parallelism to, to be able to make your programs run correctly. And this is what I'm going to be talking about. Hmm. Sorry. So when I say managing these details, what are the difficulties with managing these details that I want to talk about? Well, you have to figure out how many cores should your program use. If you have 50 cores on the machine, should every program use all 50 cores? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, how do these cores coordinate with each other if they're running the same program? And uh, how do you use these caches that these multicores have effectively? And if, the, if you're writing a parallel program, we don't really want a programmer to have to worry about all these problems. Or if he has to worry about them, at least make it easier for them to handle all these issues. So the approach that uh, I'm going to be sort of focusing on is that we should provide something I call concurrency platform that sits on top of the operating system. And the, parallel pro the programmers write parallel programs using on top of these concurrency platforms. And these concurrency platforms must manage these details automatically, or at least make it easier for the programmer to manage these details like scheduling and coordination and so on. So you might have an, a scheduler inside a concurrency platform, and it should provide some sort of a parallel API for the programmer to be able to write parallel programs. So I'm not talking about writing sequential programs and doing automatic parallelization, the programmer still writes parallel programs, just hopefully it's not that as difficult. I have a question. Yeah. In the second concurrency platform, you do not have a scheduler. Oh, that was just an example. I was just, the, the reason I have two concurrency platforms is just that you may have more than one concurrency platform on the same machine, and maybe your concurrency platform doesn't have a scheduler. I mean, in which case you just use the OS scheduler. In, in which case you might use the OS scheduler or the programmer might manage the scheduling himself. Uh, but now that I'm talking about these concurrency platforms that the programmers write on top of, we still want to provide some guarantee that the program will still run fast and still use all the resources effectively and so on, as well almost as well as if the programmer had gone down into the dredges and written the pr parallel program the difficult way. So concurrency platform, the most traditional example is, for at least for shared memory machines, is pthreads or persistent threads. Java threads are also an example of this. This is a concurrency platform because, well, you, it does provide some parallel API to be able to write parallel program. but Programmers manage almost all of the details of parallelism themselves. So it's painstaking, it's error prone to write programs using this concurrency platform. And this is not the type of concurrency platform I'm talking about. I'm going to be talking about more supportive concurrency platform. Most of my work is in this domain. And two types of uh, programming domains that have support in concurrency platforms. 
The first one is, the pro is a concurrency platform that supports streaming domains. The examples of such concurrency platforms are uh, program languages and runtime systems like Streamit, WaveScript, there are many others. Uh, this, these applications are typically digital signal processing applications, graphics applications. All of these applications, I've done some work for scheduling of these applications. But due to time constraints, I'm not going to be talking about this work at all. And you can ask me questions about it later if you want. What I'm going to be talking about today are uh, concurrency platforms that support what I call dynamic multi-threading type of applications. Most of the work I talk about also applies to task parallelism, data parallelism, and so on. Some of it doesn't. Uh, and the examples of concurrency platforms that do support this paradigm are uh, Silk, Silk++, Fortress, Nestle, even uh, Microsoft's uh, Threat Parallel Library, and so on. And uh, I'm going to talk about some work that I've done to make these concurrency platforms even more effective. Uh, I am not defining exactly what I mean by this graph and so on until later when I start talking about it more. So again, the high level goal is that we want to make parallel programming as easy as possible. And the approach I've taken is to design algorithms, data structures, programming models, et cetera, in order to implement these concurrency platforms in order to make parallel programming easier. So very high level view of all of my research. It falls into three broad categories, scheduling, synchronization, and locality. Uh, by scheduling, I mostly just mean what executes when and on which core. So I'm lumping resource allocation or load balancing into scheduling here. Uh, by, sorry, my clicker isn't working very well. By synchronization, I mean, well, how do you coordinate between cores? And by locality, I mean effectively use the caches and effectively use the fact that some cores are closer to each other than others. Uh, today, I'm only going to talk about my work in scheduling and synchronization, not about the locality work at all. So here's the outline. Most of the talk is about scheduling. I'll go into a reasonable amount of depth into one piece of work here. I'll spend about five to seven minutes just to give you a sort of a flavor of one of the projects in synchronization and then conclude. So here's the scheduling work I'm going to talk about in a reasonable amount of detail about. Uh, the title is Adaptive Scheduling with Parallelism Feedback. And I'm going to start with giving you some background on what I mean by this. So you can think of when you're scheduling parallel jobs on a multi-core, you might have a multi-core. This is an eight-core multi-core. All the circles are different cores. And the fact that they're all red essentially means that one single job is executing on all of the cores. So that job owns the machine. There is no other job on the machine. There's a large amount of both theoretical and empirical work in this domain for the last 40 years. The work that I'm going to be talking about is this, which is when you have many parallel jobs on the same multicore. So you might have a very large multicore. All the different colors are the different jobs. Now you have two problems. You have to decide how many cores each job has at any particular instant. And then you have to schedule this job on these allocated cores. And the second part of the problem reduces more or less to single parallel job on the multicore. Not completely, but more or less. So I promise that I will tell you about the job or about the dynamic multi-threaded multi jobs that I'm going to be talking about. So what are these jobs? These jobs can be represented by dynamically unfolding DAGs. So there's a node. When you start the job, you have the first instruction is ready to execute. That's my first node, the yellow node. The, pro the computer might execute that node. And now that node is executed, and the next instruction is ready to execute. This is just like sequential programs. There is no difference so far. But since it's a parallel program, some nodes might say, well, I have two nodes that can execute in parallel. So now both of these nodes are ready to execute at once. 
And this is the parallelism of the job at this instant. It's two. Now you might execute, if you had two cores, you might execute both of them. And now you have more work to be done. The parallelism is four. Ah, I think. I and so on and so forth. So you keep unfolding the job. Now, of course, even though four things were ready to be executed, you might only have two cores and only execute two of them. Doesn't mean anything bad has happened. And when the job finishes, it looks like a di directed acyclic graph. Each of these nodes is a unit time task. This is just a modeling assumption to make my definitions easier. If you had a longer task, you could just think of it as a, a chain of many unit time tasks. A, none of the schedulers that I'm going to talk, be talking about actually depend on the fact that a task is unit time. So I can define two parameters on these jobs. Work is the total number of nodes in the DAG. This is the time to execute on one processor or one core. You just execute one node at a time. It's, I'm going to represent it by T1. And span, or T infinity, is the length of the longest path in the DAG, the red path here. Even if you had an infinite number of processors, you can't execute faster than t infinity because each of these has to happen sequentially. So I don't know anything really about the future join structure. No, you know nothing. So, so, so really when, when I get a task, it may have some predecessor, but I don't know how much work has to complete before that predecessor is ready. Uh, predecessor or successor, really? Well, you say a task becomes ready when all its predecessors have been executed. Right, but, but you don't know about the task at all until mm -hmm. it's ready. I, I don't even know of its You existence. don't know anything about it. I so see. all you know here is that I have one task. But now you have one task. I only know about the frontier. You only know about the frontier. Okay. That's the assumption. You may not even know about the frontier in some cases, but mm -hmm. that's the most you know. Yeah. So a, a task might just appear out of nowhere, and it would identify set of predecessors from which it gets its results. Right. But those in predecessors some, are assumed to have been completed. Right. So this is a control flow graph in some sense. It's not data flow. It's a no. control flow graph. So no. the fact, yeah, so essentially a task spawns one or more tasks. Right. But since it's dynamic, I don't know it ahead of time. Uh, you don't know ahead of time. Yeah. How, how does it become a DAG? I mean, from the example you've showed, it's a tree to me. I mean, I don't well, no, they can join. Time. So two things can join. So this node can only be ready to be executed when both this one and this one have executed. So when you create the frontier, you're allowed to refer to existing past execution, say that yes. was also Yes. So essentially, I mean, I'm going to be mostly talking about this is sort of, this one says, execute this one, execute. So it says, so for example, if you were writing pro programs, right, you would say, well, call this function, call this function, and then join these two functions. So this one, you can only go past the it. The next step that you showed, which was one, one task executes, creates more ready right. tasks, right? How in, is there an atomic step that introduces such a join edge? That's so the atomic set, step that executes this join edge is essentially, it's not really an atomic set. It basically says, well, this one is executing along, and then it says join, right? So now, you, when, once it says join, this task cannot execute until and this has joined say, with it. it say what the other parts are? So in different, different languages or different systems, you do different things. So for example, in Silk, you can only join with your parent. So it's quite clear who you can join with. In some cases, you label who you can join with. So really, the best thing is, I mean, there's many ways that this graph can arise. Yes. But the essential points are, are really that. The idea the, the, is that it's a that graph. It's dynamic. It's dynamic. But so I can't. So I have to schedule it online. Online, yes. Just to make sure that graph you're showing is actually not a general DAC. So, uh, when, you, so when you say DAC, you explicitly also have the case where a task may have to wait for another task for arbitrary reasons that are not joins. Like like here, all the no, All the waiting conditions are joins. Yes. But um, I could imagine that a task, say, in the right hand of this graph has to wait for a task on the left hand side. So I will, so in a minute I'm going to tell you about, so in some cases, so for some schedulers, it can be an arbitrary DAG. Okay. 
in for some schedulers it has to be a specific type of tag okay. and i'll talk about it in just a minute okay. so this is the basic model of the jobs that we're talking about yeah sorry no, are you assuming fine. that join is the only way to block I mean, are you assuming that these tasks do not perform any other kind of synchronization, like blocks or semaphores? Yes, and for like now that? I'm assuming okay, that uh, the only way to block is through control flow. Yes. Uh, so now that we know that our program is a, is a DAG, uh, how can we run this program on P processors online? It's a dynamically unfolding DAG. So, well, one, the first observation is that if you had P processors, that is the entire machine is now available to this one job, right? We're looking at the traditional case. All P processors given to one job, well, it can run faster than T1 over P because it takes T1 time to run on one processor, can't do much better than T1 over P or any better than T1 over P, and it can't run faster than T infinity even it ha if it had an infinite number of processors. Now. There's a very old scheduler called greedy scheduling, which uh, can complete a job in T1 over P plus T infinity time. So this is within two of optimal. And uh, to come back to your point, greedy scheduling actually works for arbitrary DAGs. Uh, I mean, expressing arbitrary DAGs is a difficult issue. But once you've expressed the DAG, the greedy scheduler will schedule an arbitrary DAG. But with that comes a cost. Greedy scheduling has no good space bounds, so you could use a large amount of space if you're using a greedy scheduler. And it has, in some cases, especially multi-cores possibly, it has high synchronization overheads. So because it uses a centralized queue to allocate tasks to processors, it can, you can pay a lot of overhead just for synchronization in the scheduler, not in the program. So there's another alternative which is called randomized, there are many alternatives. I'm going to be talking about randomized work stealing, uh, which will complete the job in order T1 over P plus T infinity. So this is within constant factor of optimal. Greedy scheduling is within a factor of two of optimal. Well, but the, the constant hidden in the order notation is typically very small. So it is very, very close to optimal. But it does not work on arbitrary DAGs, or at least the bound doesn't work on arbitrary DAGs. It only works on essentially series parallel DAGs. There are slightly more restrictions, which are more technical, but essentially. And these are, this work stealing scheduler is implemented in many, many runtime systems that old, both old and new. Is that a series parallel DAG? Uh, this is not quite a series parallel DAG. It's almost a series parallel DAG. Which part is not series parallel? This part is, I mean, depends on how you define it. If I added just another node here to join these uh, two and then join those two, then it would be a series parallel DAG. So, I mean, work stealing will schedule this DAG, right? It's just slightly not a series parallel DAG. So I've given you some background. I'm going to do an extension where you have many jobs on the same multicore. So what is this case? Well, you have all these jobs on the same multicore, and these jobs can enter and leave the system dynamically. So say the red job leaves, the other jobs have more processors or cores available to them. So these jobs must be able to, or the scheduler must be able to adapt to these changes in the number of cores. Now, the fact that they're all close to each other doesn't mean anything. I'm only talking about numbers here. And the jobs are these jobs that I was talking about. They look like DAGs. And so what's the property of these jobs? Well, the parallelism changes during execution. The job was sequential, and then it became quite parallel, and then it's sequential again. The future parallelism is not known because the job, job is unfolding dynamically. You have no idea what's going to happen in the future. And the future parallelism isn't really correlated to the past parallelism in any way. So what can we do for jobs like this and for environments like this? Let's look at what happens for one job. Well, this is my green job. 
I'm looking at one job in a, at a time, therefore I can abstract away everything else in the system as the environment of this job. So all the other jobs in the system, whatever is the policy of the system, the fact that the jobs are arriving and leaving, and so on and so forth, is all abstracted away in this environment. And periodically, the job talks to the environment and says, well, and they do some sort of a negotiation, and then the job gets some number of cores for the next, what I'm going to call quantum, after which it talks to the environment again. So the number of processors change at quantum boundaries. So the job might get more processors, it might lose processors. And what is this negotiation is something that involves what we call parallelism feedback. So at the beginning of the quantum, the job tells the environment, give me seven processors. The environment may say, well, here, you can have seven processors. That's the allotment of the job. The allotment is always less than or equal to the desire. If the job asked for seven, it isn't going to get eight. But it can get anything from one to seven. I'm going to assume from one to seven. The fact that it can also get, sorry. It can get zero, it can get zero but for now, let's, for simplicity, let's do one to seven. The modeling gets a little more complicated if you also do zero. And the allotment doesn't change during the quantum. So once it has the seven processors, it will run on the seven processors for the entire quantum, and then it might ask for 14, get only 9, and then runs on 9. Not during the quantum, and that's so because of this. Between, between quanta, yes, it can. So the next time it might get only 1. Oh, I see. At the beginning of the quantum, it asks, and then it may get less. So it may get less. less yes, yeah, exactly. And the quantum length is presumably long enough that all this negotiation and the fact that, well, you're moving course from one job to another, right? That's the overhead of all of that is small compared to all the work you do during the quantum. So the quantum length is not one, right? I've defined some task length in the beginning. The quantum length is much larger than that, but smaller than the size of the job. It's some sort of a job has many quanta, but a quantum has many tasks. Uh, so for, for our experiments, we assumed that it was the same as the Linux quant, uh, context switching quantum. I don't know what it would be, really. And we are going to talk about how does the job ask for processors. It says, give me seven. How did it come up with this number, seven? And why is this difficult? Well. This is my quantum, say. The parallelism of the job, as we saw, can change a lot. right? So at this point, the job knows nothing about its future, and it has to ask for some number of processors for this quantum. Well, the obvious thing would be, well, I, have, I don't know what my parallelism is going to be in the future. Maybe I know what's my parallelism right now, because that's the frontier we talked about. right? Let's ask for that much. Now, unfortunately, this is not so good, right? Because the parallelism may go down, and then the job is just going to waste processor cycles. Now, we are considering the case where there are other jobs in the system, right? So this is not good. The other jobs could have used this. Or we could have shut down those cores and saved power. On the other hand, this instantaneous parallelism thing may also sometimes make the job ask for too few cores and then it will run too slowly. So really, an effective parallelism feedback algorithm should try to reduce both completion time and waste. Well, these are competing criteria. You can't really optimize them both, but you want to minimize them both as much as possible. Oh, I also want to point out that this instantaneous parallelism feedback doesn't also work for the K, for the reason that you might not even know what your instantaneous parallelism is. In the case of work stealing, it's not easy to even know that. For greedy scheduling, you know. But So now I've been saying, well, the job asks for processors and so on and so forth. But all of this talk is about concurrency platforms, right? So the programmer doesn't say, well, ask for processors, right? What happens is that 
you put an algorithm for requesting processors into a concurrency platform in addition to the scheduler, which is in the concurrency platform. So if we, we, we have a feedback algorithm which you can combine with either greedy scheduling or work stealing, it's essentially the same algorithm. And once you do that, you have a guarantee that the job will complete quickly and waste few processor cycles, by which I mean that we have bounds on both of these. Uh, now, of course, the analysis depends on the adversary, or the analysis depends on the environment, which we know nothing about, because we have no idea what the environment will be like. So we assume that the environment is the adversary of the job. And in order to handle that, we use something we call trim analysis. And we also did some experiments, both using simulations and by implementing this feedback algorithm in Silk. And it uh, looks like it will probably be useful. They're quite preliminary experiments. So let me show you what the feedback algorithm looks like. It's quite simple. So as we said, before quantum Q, the job needs to figure out how many processors to ask for. So it needs to compute the desire for quantum Q. It knows nothing about quantum Q, because Q is just starting. But it knows about quantum Q minus 1. So it knows that the desire for quantum Q minus 1 was 8. The allotment for quantum Q minus 1 was 8. And there's another parameter which, is, which I'm going to call usage, which is essentially how many processor cycles did I use effectively. So I got eight processors. The quantum length was L, for example. So I had eight L processor cycles available to me. Did I use more than 90% of them effectively to do real work, or did I not? So what was the waste threshold? Now, the, the job obviously knows all of these parameters. And it uses these to ask for processors for the next quantum. Yes? So it seems like you're missing some information. You have one dimension where you're saying that, OK, I'm not wasting. But what about the dimension where I got less than I needed? Uh, I'm going to talk about that. Yes, there is. So I mean, this is just an example, right? You might have only gotten seven. Uh, so. Now, this might look like there's an assumption, right? This might look like, well, if the parallelism was whatever in the previous quantum, it's going to remain close to that in the next quantum. This is not true. The analysis does not assume that the parallelism changes smoothly. The parallelism could have been 1 in this quantum and can be 100 in the next quantum. It can change arbitrarily, and it can change arbitrarily fast. Yes. Can you just say quantitatively again, what is the guarantee you provide this feedback algorithm? The guarantee it provides that is that the job will run quickly and not waste too many processor cycles. But the thing is that, how can you do that? Because I could, be com I could have written a completely stupid parallel program in which everything is completely sequential. Yes, how but then you, you should only work? ask for, then the feedback algorithm will only ask for one processor, ever. So I mean, it dip up to the limit of the parallelism of the program, right? It will run fast up to the limit of the parallelism oh, of the program. The component sitting in the program monitoring its parallelism, and you uh, you design how much how much uh, parallelism it asks for. Asks for, for exactly. Okay, yes, so I mean, it runs fast up to the limit of its parallelism. If your program is not parallel, it's going to run sequentially. So as I said, we don't assume that there is any correlation between the parallelism here and the parallelism here. And this algorithm, which only depends on the past, still manages to do well. So here's an, this is an example of where you can use the past to make the decisions about the future, even though the past is not correlated to the future. It's not quite true, but almost true. Uh, so here's the algorithm. It's a simple seven-line algorithm. At the end of the algorithm, you know what the desire should be for the next quantum. Well, the first case is this is the first quantum. The job is just starting. You know nothing about the past. So just do the trivial thing and ask for one processor. Now we get a little interesting. If the previous quantum was inefficient, by which I mean that the waste was more than say 10 percent. I got eight, I got 10 processors. I only really effectively used nine of them. 
for example. Then the job says, well, I asked for too many last time. Just have my desire. The next case is, now both of these cases are when the previous quantum was efficient, right? In this case, the allotment is equal to the desire. So I'm coming to that point where you make a distinction between whether how many you asked for and how many you got. So I asked for 10 and I got 10. They're both equal. And I used all, all 10 reasonably effectively. My waste was less than 10%, for example. Then the job says, well, maybe I could have used more. So it says, let me ask for more. It asks for double. And the third case is when the allotment is less than the desire. So I asked for 10. I got only 8, but I used the 8 effectively. Now I have no information on whether I could have used the 10 effectively. So I stay the same. I ask for 10 again. And that's all there is to it. Uh, and it happens to do well. Now, there's no magic about 2. That number can be anything bigger than 1. And it changes the constants in the asymptotics. I still have a question. Um, did you arrive at these numbers like 2 or 10 percent? Oh, that was or? just examples. Those are just examples. But well, you say you do, in a, you do a theoretical. I, I mean, I can see how you, you could find out which numbers you want to use in an experiment. But for your theoretical analysis, do these numbers? Uh, for theoretical analysis, these numbers matter only in constant factors. So we use parameters. So really, we use epsilon and delta, which are parameters. And your answer is in terms of epsilon and delta. But as far as they are constants, they are in the asymptotes. Yeah. Now, the other question is, um, this reminds me a bit of like flow control and TCP-IP, where you have mm -hmm. additive increase, but multiplicative increase. Right. Uh, we can't do that. Okay. We have to do multiplicative increase and multiplicative decrease. Yes. And also, there's this weird third case that isn't really there in TCP-IP. So it's, li it's sort of like that, but slightly different. And of course, the, the criteria, optimization criteria, are completely different. So that's all about the algorithm. I'm going to touch very briefly about the analysis. So well, I haven't said anything about the environment yet. Right? Because the job doesn't know anything about the environment. The algorithm doesn't use any information about the environment. But we have to model the environment in order to do the analysis. So here's how I'm going to model the environment. At the beginning of the quantum, the job says, give me seven processors. How does the environment decide how many to give? Out of nowhere, it comes up with a number, which is called the availability for this job. So the environment decides that it has 10 processors for this job for the next quantum. This number appears because of other jobs in the system, whatever is the environment's policy, right? It doesn't tell the job what this number is, but the job always gets the minimum of the desire and the processor availability. So the job asked for 7. The availability was 10, but it only gets 7. The remaining 3 presumably go to other jobs, or they may be shut down. And then so on, right? The job might ask for 14. The environment might decide that the availability is 9, and the job will only get 9. Now, I keep saying that the environment is the job's adversary. What does that really mean? Well, the processor availability is decided by some adversary of the job, which is trying to make let us not get good bounds, right? Now, this adversary that I'm assuming here is very, very powerful. I assume that the job doesn't know anything about the future. But the assumption is that the environment knows everything about the future. The environment knows exactly what the job's parallelism is going to be for all time. In fact, you can assume that the environment actually generates the job's parallelism for the future. So it's a very powerful adversary. Now, against this powerful adversary, what do we really want to prove? I haven't even said. So I'm going to do this by analogy. Remember we said something about when the entire machine is given to a job. So all P processors of the machine are given to the same job. I can model this as, well, the availability for that job is always P, right? when there's only one job in the system. And we've already seen what happens then. Both greedy scheduling and work stealing guarantee that the completion time is order T1 over P plus T infinity. 
What that really means is that the speed up is about order p. If you give p processors to the job, the job will run p times faster up to the limit of its parallelism. This is what I mean by up to the limit of its parallelism. Now, back to our scenario where the availability changes in every quantum. So instead of p, I really want to use p mean. So I want to say that the completion time is order t, p, t1 over p mean plus t infinity. And then the speed up would be about p mean. This would be very nice up to the limit of its parallelism. Very analogous result. Unfortunately, no feedback algorithm can give you this guarantee. Even if your feedback algorithm knew all about the future, the adversary can prevent you from giving this guarantee. Why? Very simple example is that the adversary knows all about the future, right? So maybe you have a quantum where you're going to run sequentially. You have no parallelism in that quantum. The adversary can decide that the availability is a million or infinity for that quantum. And it can decide that the availability is really low in all other quantum. What that means is your p mean is high, but there's no way you can get a speed up of p mean, even if you had a lot of parallelism in all other quantum. So no feedback algorithm can get you that bound, but we want something like that bound. So what are we going to do? We are going to use something which is slightly different. And the idea is, well, the adversary just makes your life difficult by making availability really, really high sometimes. So I'm going to allow my analysis to ignore those. So the availability was really high on this step. I'm just going to ignore that step while computing the mean. So the mean goes down a little. And maybe that step, the mean goes down a little more. And maybe I can get a speed up equal to the new p mean. So more formally, an R trimmed mean is actually almost a statistical measure, not quite, is well, you have uh, availability, you ignore, you sort them, ignore the r largest values, and compute the mean of the remaining. And I'm going to use that instead. This is very funny because you suddenly change the analysis to yes. find a bound for yourself. Is this something standard people do? Or you no, this is not something. But I'm going to show you why this is reasonable in a second. Okay. Yes. Which is that he said the environment is me is uh, is adversary that can give you say ah oh, I have a million plus right. Million. But that still won't affect really the usage usage because the the, the schedule the job obviously did not ask for a million, only right. asked for ten. Right. So that doesn't matter, right? It's the ten that will. Well, no. So if you no, you cannot do this analysis with respect to the allotment. That's the allotment, right? Because that's trivial. The job can always ask for one processor, and then it will get speed up by equal to mean allotment. Right. So a very trivial algorithm will give you good speed up and good waste. If you were to do. Because if I'm asking for too little, right? Well, but you're getting speed up equal to the mean allotment, right? So I want to prove something like this, right? Here, I'm using the mean availability. If you were to use mean allotment here instead, this bound is very trivial to get okay. for, any, for a feedback algorithm. So you want a good feedback algorithm right? that does something nice in the sense that it asks for the right number of processors. Now, you can always ask for one processor. You always get one processor. The mean allotment is one. Your completion time bound just says that you will complete in t1 time which is all you need to. You have to do the, and you really should do the availability, right? That's the number of processors that were available to you. It doesn't, it shouldn't depend on what you asked for, right? So here's why this is reasonable, right? For, now the idea was that I'm going to provide speed up with equal to R trimmed mean availability for small r. The small r is an important factor, right? Because speed up equal to three trimmed mean is better than speed up equal to five trimmed mean. You want as high a speed up as possible. And what does this really mean, right? 
I've, I'm doing this analysis for an adversarial environment because I know nothing about the environment. What, do, what does this analysis mean for non-adversarial environment? For almost any non-adversarial environment that you can think of, for small r, the p trim r is almost equal to p mean. For example, if you generated your availability just uniformly at random, then ignoring a small number of time steps isn't going to change your mean very much. Therefore, for, if you, for an adversarial environment, I'm guaranteeing that the speed up is equal to p trim r. For a non-adversarial environment, this basically means that the speed up is equal to p mean, which is asymptotically optimal. Yes? Depend on this, this shape of that distribution. I mean, if, if it turned out that the sort of things that you trimmed were most of the mass under the Right, curve. but that is so almost an adversarial environment, right? But so that's, that, but that's not a characteristic of the environment as much as your, your code, how much resources it uses, right? No, the, the, the availability is entirely the property of an environment. This thing is entirely the property of an environment. Our code isn't controlling the availability at all. Would it be fair to characterize what you did as the following? That if you assume a wildly adversarial environment, then it's very hard to get any meaningful bounds. You're right. just controlling how much adversarial it can exactly. be. Exactly. This, okay. is, this is exactly what it is. Okay. It's basically saying if your environment is absolutely and completely adversarial, then yes, you can do nothing. But if your environment isn't absolutely and completely adversarial, then this is quite good. And really, like what happens is that this is almost theory, theory, right? So it's quite pessimistic. Really, you don't trim the largest time steps. In, in our algorithm, or if you actually look at the real analysis, you're going to trim some random subset of your time steps. But it seems that the, trim, the trimming business is only part of the analysis. It's so only part of the, no, um, my algorithm isn't. But yeah. I'm just saying that even if you look at the analysis, the yeah. steps we trim aren't necessarily the largest steps. That's just the worst case. You could trim the largest steps, is all I'm saying. That's a sort of a technical point. So here's the uh, theorem in all its gory detail. You have a job with work T1, critical path length T infinity. You're running on a p-core machine, and your quantum length is L. The waste, and you combine our feedback algorithm with either greedy scheduling or work stealing. Well, work stealing gives you a uh, sort of high probability bound, which I haven't shown here. Uh, the waste is at most order T1. That might look quite bad, <laughs> right? Because you can waste almost as much as you work. But that's really the best you can do theoretically. Our empirical results actually show that the waste isn't really that bad. But theoretically, if you also want a completion time bound, you cannot do better for waste bound. And the completion time is that weird number but let's compare it to what we wanted. I said this was my ideal completion time. This is asymptotically optimal. So order t1 over p mean plus t infinity. Well, you added this L log p. But if you have a 1,000 core machine, this means that you're adding 10 quanta, which is not very much extra time. And you have a p trim r instead of p mean, which I argued will be about equal for non-adversarial environments. So in, if you squint a lot, this is asymptotically optimal. But you have to squint a lot. A question? Yeah. It seems like you're focused on the completion time here. It's not clear to me why you couldn't do something where you kind of get a slightly weaker bound for completion time, but better ways. I mean, better ways. Uh, asymptotically, you cannot do better on waste. Basically, you cannot do better on waste even if you knew all about the future, if you wanted any reasonable completion time bound. Because essentially, you could have, as I said, your parallelism can change wildly. right? So you could have a quantum. So every quantum is, has, a following, has the following property. It has a lot of parallelism, and then it has no parallelism. Whatever you ask for, you're going to waste something in the second part of the quantum. But if I had more reasonable parallelism models, maybe you could use If you something. had, so as I said, in practice, you almost never waste that much. But that's the best you can do theoretically, assuming the worst case. So very briefly about the experimental results. 
we simulated a very coarse simulation of a very large multicore. Uh, it was just a discrete time sort of waste or work type of simulation. Uh, we, did, we did a large number of experiments, generated graphs randomly, or they really have a particular property where they have a lot of parallelism and then no parallelism and then a lot of parallelism in order to stress test our algorithm. And we see that you almost always get linear speed up, up to the limit of the parallelism, of course, and you don't waste too much. This is almost always less than 20%, usually less than 10% waste. We also compared against another work stealing scheduler, which allows you to change the number of processors given to the scheduler, but it doesn't provide any parallelism feedback. So the only difference between our algorithm and this algorithm is the feedback. The remaining part is all the same. So we just want to evaluate the feedback. Uh, we see that, uh, so the solid line is our algorithm, the dotted line is ABP. What happens is that this is a thousand core machine. Jobs are generated randomly and arrive on this machine at random intervals. At the beginning, and this is the utilization over time. In the beginning, we have really low utilization because everyone asks for one processor and slowly ramps up. Oh, this is the logarithmic scale, by the way. Uh, and then, but pretty soon, we get to a point where we have higher utilization than ABP. And eventually, we get to more than 90% utilization, which essentially means that we're not wasting too much of the machine, while ABP continues to waste a large fraction of the machine, uh, which directly implies that the mean completion time of our thing is smaller because you're using the machine to do real work. There are more experiments that I can talk about later. Uh, so just to put this work into context, what I've talked about so far are all local properties of the system, which means that I'm assuming that this red concurrency platform is using my algorithm and using greedy scheduling or work stealing. It only has control over one job, this one. It has no control over the rest of the machine, so all it can say is that it can provide guarantee that this job will run fast and not waste too many processor cycles. Can't say anything about other jobs. But what happens if you give the control of the entire machine to this algorithm? And you assume that you have some reasonable uh, allocation policy in the sense that the operating system doesn't just like hold back processors and doesn't do strange things then you can guarantee that the, there's a small make span, which means that all the jobs will, the last job will complete fast, and small mean completion time. Now, when I say small, I mean constant competitive with the optimal. Usually, make span and mean completion time are competing criteria. So the fact that this algorithm provides both of them is kind of interesting. I should mention that this part of the work is not my work. Someone else did it subsequently. I'm just showing it to you to put this in context. Uh, I'm going to spend five minutes on the synchronization portion of the talk and be quite imprecise all over the place. So in the synchronization portion of the talk, I'm going to talk about one piece of work I did in transactional memory. And first, to give you some context and what I even mean by synchronization, Different people mean different things by synchronization. I just mean that all cores, you have n cores, and they all talk to each other through shared memory. I'm not showing any caches here because this is an abstract view of my multicore. And an incorrect, incorrect synchronization leads to errors. And what do I mean by that? I mean when two cores access the same memory location in order to synchronize, they can interfere with each other if you're not careful. And of course, I mean races here, but I'm not defining them precisely. So I'm calling them interferences. Uh, so core one and core two can interfere with each other because they both access Y. Core one cannot interfere with core three. Core two cannot interfere with core three. It's the high level idea. Now, of course, we don't want these interferences. So you have to provide some mechanism so that the programmer can prevent these interferences. 
And so the concurrency platform can provide some mechanism. And we want this mechanism to be easy to use. And we want this mechanism to be highly concurrent, because we want our concurrency platform to allow you to write efficient parallel programs. Now, locks are a traditional synchronization method. You can use coarse-grained locking, where essentially I mean single global lock. One lock pr protects all of memory, or all of memory that you care about. Very easy to use, but does not provide much concurrency. Or you can use fine-grained locks, which provide a lot of concurrency, but can lead to deadlocks. And therefore, it's difficult to write programs using fine-grained locks, which are correct. Hurley and, uh, and Moss proposed transactional memory in 93, uh, which transactional memory is as easy to use as coarse-grained locking, but can, be, can provide almost the concurrency of fine-grained locking often. So high-level view of transactional memory is this. Uh, you transactional memory ensures that a code region that is enclosed in a transaction runs atomically. And how does it do it? Well, it speculatively executes the code region. And if there, it detects any interference, so it will detect that core 1 and core 2 interfere with each other, then it will abort one of them, for example, this one, and undo all its changes so that it looks like it never happened, and therefore core 1 will finish without interference. And if there's no interference, then you can execute in parallel. This is where it gets the concurrency. Now, I'm getting to my piece of work. Uh, transactional memory often, designs particularly, often have certain restrictions because of performance reasons. One of them is that transactional memory designs do not allow parallelism inside transactions. So you have all these transactions. Uh, you can have transaction T2 inside transaction T1. But there's no parallelism inside transactions. And this is because most TM designers work in the persistent threaded view of the world, where the programmer explicitly programs these persistent threads that run on different cores and writes transactions on these threads. We want to work on the dynamically multi-threaded view, where your program looks like a DAG, right? And the runtime system automatically takes care of the scheduling. Now, if your program looks like this, you might want to put transactions of this sort, which basically means all of this region is inside one transaction. All of this region is inside one, this one transaction. They shouldn't interfere with each other. But most TM designs do not allow this. And why not? Well, because now that you have parallelism inside a transaction, this node and this node execute in parallel and can interfere with each other. So now to prevent this interference, you want to do something like this. And these are called nested parallel transactions because T3 and T4 are both nested inside T1, enclosed inside T1, but are in parallel with each other. Conflict detection becomes more and more expensive as you have more and more nesting, typically, which is why most people don't support this. And uh, so our contribution was a design which allows you to write programs like this. I mean, why is conflict detection difficult when you have nested parallel transactions? Inside the, 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 the threads inside. Uh, let me the, show you here. So okay. the idea is that usually the way conflict detection is done is that you see if two transactions are executing on different cores or different threads. And if they are, and they access memory in an interfering manner, then there's a conflict, right? These two, there's a conflict. Now, in this case, everything is scheduling de scheduler dependent. So this entire thing executes on core 1. This executes on core 2. This executes on core 3. You can't easily detect conflicts because there's no conflict between this node and this node. But there is a conflict between this node and this node. So you can't just compare core IDs to figure out if there is a conflict or not. Now, in this case, you can still do it, right? But as you have more and more nesting, and the scheduling is dynamic, it's not so easy to figure out if you are in series with someone or not, or whether there's a conflict or not. 
you need a more complicated identifier sitting there. You need a, you need a more it. complicated conflict detection mechanism, yes. But I mean, you don't want to spend too much time on conflict detection either, right? So our idea is that we manage to detect conf Well, of course, now conflict detection depends on the scheduling. And our design works on a work stealing scheduler again. And this allows, our design allows you to nest as much as you want. The conflict detection cost does not increase with the depth of nesting. Naive designs, that would be true. Our design, you can nest as much as you want, and the conflict detection cost does not increase. In fact, the conflict detection cost is order one, but you have to keep extra data structures. So the runtime is slightly more than it would be without transactions. And I'm not going into details for this because I'm running out of time. Yeah. Are you again with the same question? Which, how general is your DAG in this case? Oh, it's series parallel. Okay. So it's a, whatever you can run on a work stealing okay. scheduler. Yeah. And I mean, less than series parallel almost doesn't make sense for transactional yeah. memory. It make yeah, it, it's like, why would you write it, right? It just, it's very, very strange to have transactions when you, you could, don't. You could, come up with you could come up with examples, but yeah, we, this is whatever you can write with work steel, with silk. Uh, so to wrap up, I'm going to just review. I talked about adaptive scheduling, which does automatic resource allocation, basically. So the programmer doesn't have to analyze the parallelism of the program. They just run whatever programs they want to run on the system. And the system will automatically figure out how many processors each program should have. I talked about nested parallel transactions, which allow you to compose your programs now. right? You can write a parallel library and call it from within a transaction. And it wouldn't break, which it would without this. And scalability, because you can design. You can express a lot of parallelism, because you can do recursive parallelism now, which wasn't possible. Uh, another question. When you, so when you say anything you can write with Silk, um, how, how static or dynamic is that? Is, is Silk is completely dynamic, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you know nothing <clears throat> statically. Okay. All you know is that, I mean, no, seri you cannot express programs that are not series parallel. But what, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the transactions have to be properly nested. Mm -hmm. I mean, regular TM semantics have to apply. Uh, I've also worked on another project related to synchronization, also related to transactional memory that I did not talk about today, uh, which makes increases the composability again and the concurrency. It's a slightly different programming model. It's an extension of the regular DM programming model. I have a question about that. So you didn't mention open nesting. At all. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, that... this is, that's that <laughs> okay. piece of work. Yes. Uh, because it's too much background. But we can talk about it offline if you wish. Uh, another piece of work is uh, that I did not talk about at all is related to streaming. Uh, I did some locality aware scheduling, scheduling where you have to, you're aware of caches and you want to use caches effectively. Uh, more work on transactional memory is just semantics of transactional memory, how to define them, how to use them. And then there's this piece of work, most of my work tries to make programs run faster. This is just a fun piece of work that tries to make programs run slower. Uh, not very useful, but a lot of fun. <laughs> well, though, but they actually work on it where it might actually be used. That one, no. Um, so future research directions, just some ideas in this space that I've talked about. There's, of course, like whole other areas of parallel programming that I didn't touch upon at all. Well, one of them is handling heterogeneity in both applications and in platforms. So I talked about dynamic multi-threaded programs. I talked about stream programs. There can be programs which are combinations of these two. How do you schedule these programs? How do you load balance for these programs? And so on and so forth is an interesting question. And the second question is, well, you have a computer which has a CPU and a GPU and whatever else, right? And then how do you schedule 
on those program computers. I have some ideas in both of these domains, but they're not well formed enough. Locality aware scheduling, I've done some work in this area for streaming programs. Streaming programs are almost the easiest domain to handle in this space. But if you have other types of programs, how do you manage to utilize caches effectively? Uh, contention management, I used to be interested in this. I don't know if I am very much anymore, but I'd like to look at it at some point. If you have transactions and they abort, which transactions should you abort? When should you restart them? And so on and so forth. There's a lot of work in the database community in this domain, in this space, but transactional memory has a different set of parameters, so you have to worry about different things. And something that I'm working on right now is uh, schedulers with good space bounds. Well, I said work stealing, or I didn't say, but I should have said that work stealing has good space bounds but not for programs which have locks or transactions. Any type of synchronization blows out all space bounds. So how do you do good space bounds for programs with locks and transactions? My general approach to research, look at practical problems, such as these or others, uh, find provably good solutions, and then also try to see if they're practically applicable. Thank you. How much time do you estimate you spend of your six years on simulating and prototyping? Uh, a lot of it in the first three years. Not so much since. Both of the things that I talked about today, well, the first thing is completely implemented in Silk. The second one is sort of implemented in Silk. All the data structures are there. The problem is that you have to instrument all memory accesses to do transactional memory. And that requires changes to the Silk compiler, and compilers are a horror for me, so I have not done that yet. So actually, I have a follow-up question. That you mentioned that you simulated a thousand-core machine. What's how did you do that? Oh, simulation? it was not. It's it's a very, as I said, very very coarse simulation. Essentially, we just at every step the program executes one instruction, right? So it's a really really slow simulation using this simple event-based Java simulation. Oh, I see. Yeah, so it's not cycle accurate. It, it was just like proof of concept type of thing. It's not, okay. it's not very, it's not interesting as simulation technology, certainly. So do you simulate uh, random workload or, or workload based on algorithms? Uh, so random workloads. The, work, the programs we simulated were generated randomly, but the properties were sometimes based on these studies saying uh, what kind of workloads are usually. But there aren't too many studies on parallel workloads, so it's so hard to see. The theoretical see. analysis, you assume adversary models. Right. And then in your simulation, uh, if you use random workloads, it sounds like it ties well into the theoretical model. So the workloads, uh, when I say workloads are, so the, so when, when you said workload, I thought you meant the kind of graphs that or kind right. of jobs, workload right? Of right. Exactly. So we did a few different simulations. The, one, the simulation that I showed was when you have randomly generated graphs that arrive into the machine. Uh, we also did simulation, well, and in that case, there's no adversary question, right? Because the adversary was only applicable when I was looking for one job and its environment. We also d did simulations for that, which was essentially, well, you have one job running on the machine, and you have some processor availability that was adversarial. Right, but of course, I had this uh, question pent up during the talk, which was, well, so you assume that uh, you do the scheduling on the fly, you don't have any idea of how the process is going to take place, and that sounds uh, immediately uh, realistic, but what if we had an ability to trace applications to, say, uh, basically get an estimate that not, now my application is going to use parallelism, now it's not going to use parallelism. If you had that it, information, uh, then yes, you should use it. What, what are the models uh, for analyzing such systems? Or 
Uh, I have not worked on that area, so I don't really know how to figure out what the parallelism is going to be in the future. All of this work was done in the context of the silk run, silk run time system, where you really have no information. What you have to build such? Right, right. I mean, it's just that it's so difficult when you're looking at arbitrary parallel programs, right? Because it depends on, first, it depends on the input. But the more difficult part is that it depends on the scheduler. The scheduler we are looking at is a randomized scheduler. So every time you run the program, it's going to run in a different manner. Because you might do one thing the first time, another thing the second time. So I'm not sure even if you collected a trace the first time saying that, oh, my parallelism was one in the first quantum, it was two in the second quantum, five in the third quantum. It's not applicable anymore the next time because your graph might unfold in a different manner, if, even with the same input. So, so actually, that's kind of interesting. So there's a lot of work in uh, compiler research, which is uh, you know they collect trace information and then they do uh, optimization based on that. I think one high-level point that you just made is that that kind of stuff is uh, much less effective when concurrency is involved because uh, your traces just can be kind of wildly non-deterministic depending right. on the input and also on the scheduling. On the scheduling. The scheduling is the difficult part to handle because a deterministic schedulers are often, so greedy scheduling, you can make it quite deterministic, but deterministic schedulers are often very centralized schedulers and then they're not particularly effective or scalable. Sometimes they can be, in many cases they aren't. And distributed schedulers are often, it's often difficult to make distributed schedulers <coughs> completely deterministic. So you, you, were, um, you, you presented in the, in the context of multi-cores, like one machine, many cores, you run a program. But is this scheduling, uh, I mean, the schedule is pretty abstract. Yeah, it doesn't really matter except the problem is neither greedy scheduling nor work stealing are particularly effective in distributed memory machines. So the parallelism feedback part of it, well, you can do it, right? But if I, practically speaking, well, multi-cores and symmetric multiprocessors, it's fine. Both of them are perfectly OK. Distributed memory machines, there's too much data movement in both of them for it to be particular. So neither of, well, there are, dis, there are uh, distributed memory, ma, memory implementations of uh, work stealing, uh, but they've never sh proven to be particular. And of course, my thing really depends on how good the underlying scheduler is. So. But I imagine that if you had a good scheduler for distributed memory machine, which I don't know of any, if you had one, then the feedback algorithm would probably be fine. It's sort of very basic. Uh, you'd have to do the analysis again, but yeah. So what would happen is, um, so all, I understand that all your computations are memory bound. What would happen if the um, tasks are blocked by I.O.? Yes, uh, so I am trying to work on that now, but we don't have, like, when you have blocking other than uh, join type blocking, it's it's difficult, I mean, when I said synchronization, difficult to get space bounds for or time bounds for synchronization, the same problem is for I.O. You can either get good completion time or you can get good space. Getting both of them together as soon as you, whenever you have any kind of blocking is difficult. So, but actually, but the question is that will your algorithm work in those cases? It will do the scheduling, right? It Even will, if the it, tasks block. It will do the scheduling, but it's not the i mean it depends on what decision you make when you block right? right when you block you can either decide to just block and wait or you can block and go work on something else and suspend whatever right oh, so you if you block actually... you have to make some decision if you block and just block and wait well you can generate adversarial conditions where everyone blocks all the time and bad stuff happens right and if you block and go work on something else well my algorithm will work but you wouldn't want to use it because there's too much space. So space issues rear their heads really quickly as soon as you have 
locking or I/O and so on. So wh why did you actually do the your evaluation on a simulator? Is that because you can't get a? We don't have a machine. Well, I did this work three years ago. We didn't have a parallel machine. Well, the biggest parallel machine we had was four cores. Now we have eight cores. I can run it on eight cores. But this is, well, if you have eight cores, you're all. You can get one or two or four or eight cores for a machine for a program, right? It's not particularly interesting to see what happens. So the only reason to evaluate it on an eight core machine was to check overheads. And we saw that the overheads weren't bad at all. Well, there's like seven lines of code you run every few milliseconds. It's not going to be bad. Um, I have a question. Did you ever encounter the problem? So you mentioned that there's too much data movement in, in distributed settings. Now, on shared memory processes, there's also data movement, which can also be a problem. Is that yeah. sort, of, sort of contained in this locality problem? Oh, so I haven't worked on locality problems for, well, I'm working on this now, which is sort of related to locality. But I haven't really worked on locality problems for dynamic multi-threaded okay. jobs at all, very much. I thought about it a little, but there aren't easy solutions. Thank you. Thank you.